Hello again everyone, Mary Rose here at Stitch Bliss Corner. Uh, welcome. Uh, now this is one of my artist videos and today we're going to be covering Toulouse Lautrec. Uh, now I have called this vi video uh, The Painter of the Night, uh, which I think suits this particular man. Uh, he tended to live a bit of a twilight existence between the light and the dark um, uh, for for reasons that were beyond his control uh, let's say to begin his life anyway uh, and then I think to a degree the world he lived in at the time dictated uh, the life and the lifestyle that he went with um, but his full name was Henri Marie Raymond uh, de Toulouse Lautrec Monfort, and the DE part, uh, usually from what I can understand, denoted that the person was of aristocratic descent. Uh, and he was a French painter, printmaker, draftsman, caricaturist, caricaturist, and illustrator. Now I've got here, he mixed in the world of entertainment and hedonistic pursuits of the well-to-do at one end of the spectrum and the day-to-day -day grind of those who supplied the entertainment at the other end of the spectrum. And he spanned both sides of that world. Um, now he was born in Albi, France in 1864 and he died September 9th, 1901. Now he was only 37 when he died. Um, and so his life, life was short, but it was very momentous. Um, he, as he was the firstborn, he would have become a count. He, you know, he would have inherited the land and estates and title of his father. Uh, but he, his father, as it happened, outlived him. So that didn't happen. Now, he had a younger brother who died and that was too much for the parents and they separated not long after that happened and Toulouse went to live with his mother in Paris when he was eight years old. Now he went back to Albi, that's where he was born, for his health and for the mineral baths that they had there. Now the reason, oh I'll just go on, I'll explain about his health shortly. His ability for drawing and painting was recognised early in his life and his mother encouraged his ability. Toulouse's parents were first cousins. His grandmothers on both sides were sisters. And of course that didn't pass the consanguinity. Uh, because of this it is believed that he was born with a congenital propensity for faulty bone growth. And what happened was when he was, you know, he was a, a sickly child anyway, uh, but then um, he was on horseback when he was 13. He, he really liked outdoor pursuits, which is really, up, you know, a sad thing when someone uh, is that way inclined, actively in, inclined, and then uh, because of their body, that stops them from doing the things they want to do. But anyway, he got on a horse and he fell off and he broke one of his femurs. And then the following year, it didn't um, knit properly together because he had a congenital problem with his bones. They wouldn't knit back together properly. And then the following year, he broke the other femur as well. So um, he ended up, uh, he didn't grow any further. The length of his legs didn't get any longer but his torso developed normally. So although he had a normal sized torso, his legs were very short. Um, his height as an adult was four foot eight inches or 1.42 meters. Although some say it was, he was four foot 11. So I don't know which is true, but you know, it, it still affected him. Uh, not only physically, but mentally as well, you know, you can imagine. Um, as he was unable to engage in physical activity, 
he would risk his getting injured. Oh, sorry, that would risk his getting injured. He concentrated on his talent for art. So I suppose in that way, he was blessed with um, talent, at least, that he could fill his days in doing something else. Um, now, as he, he, when he was younger, he uh, drew horses a lot. He really liked horses. Uh, and I've got a lot of pictures here, here to show you. Uh, this is just to give you a quick outline. He supplied the magazine Lee Rear, that's R-I-R-E, I don't know how you say that, with a number of illustrations. And eventually he returned to Paris and studied art under Leon Bonnat, that's B-O-N-N-A-T, a portrait painter. His mother swung that for him as she was keen to have her son make a mark as a successful painter in Paris circles. Uh, Bonnat happened to live in Montmartre. Now, I've had a listen on the interpreter on, on you know, how you can put a word in as they'll tell you how it's said. And it's Montmartre or Montmartre is how you pronounce it. Um, and now that was the hub of bohemian lifestyle of the rich and, and not so rich as well as writers and philosophers. Uh, it was, you know, in Toulouse's time, it was sort of the golden age, apparently, of that area, where all of these people, bohemian type people, dancers, singers, poets, playwrights, uh, they all used to flock to this Montmartre area in, in uh, France. And it was on the outskirts of Paris, so rent was a lot cheaper there. Um, so that was another thing that drew people to this area. Um, and it's where the rich and the influential mixed with the plebeians in the brothels and the actresses and actors in the theatres. Toulouse lived there for the next 20 years of his life and rarely left it. After Bonnard, uh, Toulouse studied under Ferdinand Cormand in 1882 and he formed a group of friends in his inner circle. He met Van Gogh and Emile Bernard. Um, Cormon allowed his pupils to wander around Paris and find subjects to paint on location. And under these circumstances, his friends are reputed to have set him up with a prostitute. And this experience brought about his first painting of one. Um, now, he first publicly exhibited his work in 1887 and he took part in the independent artist salon regularly. He showed a series from the garden of Pierre Foret, or Foret, F-O-R-E-T, with Carmen Godin, who had glorious red hair as his subject. I've got some pictures there for you. She also appeared in the painting The Laundress in 1888. When the Moulin Rouge Cabaret opened in Montmartre, um, Toulouse was commissioned to produce a series of posters to advertise up and coming features and to let everyone know that there was an exciting venue for them to attend. Uh, now, that's the thing in those days. Uh, now, the telephone was invented in 1876, so that was around. The telegraph in eight, the 1830s, so they had those. But they didn't really have, radio wasn't invented until 1895, which was fairly late in the piece uh, for um, Toulouse. That's when, when did he die again? Excuse me a minute. 1901, so I mean that's 1895, so, um, and there was film around, but there was no sound until 1927. So if you were the owner of a cabaret or any kind of nightclub venue or a big cafe or anything like that, the only way you could uh, advertise uh, for your venue was either in a magazine or, you know, the newspapers, I suppose they had classifieds or whatever, um, or posters or word of mouth or the people that used to get around with the sandwich boards on, you know, with a big board and they used to walk around the place advertising. Uh, so posters were very important. And because they were posters, uh, Toulouse felt anyway, that they had to be very much straight to the point. They had to be bright to catch your eye. 
they had to be, uh, you know, there were not too many words on them and to get to the point pretty quickly. And I've got some uh, posters here to show you, or some advertisements at least, of others at the time, just to show you uh, that uh, quite a few other uh, artists, uh, many of their advert advertisements were quite complex looking. I mean, you didn't get the message immediately, you looked at it. But with Toulouse, uh, he had this mastery of being, being able to, to tell you in, in a glance uh, whether you wanted to see something or whether you didn't or, you know, what was available, uh, which was a, a great talent to have. It's easy today to see, you know, you look at billboards and everything and they're straight to the point, but that wasn't necessarily the case when Toulouse started. And in fact, a lot of uh, his peers that, you know, put out posters, they tended to deride him uh, with his methods, but he didn't bother him. He had his own way of doing things. And because he had the, his own income and everything, he didn't have to pander to anyone. He could just do as he wanted, uh, which is great for your artistic license. You know, if you've got uh, independent means, well, you know, it, it helps you to be, you know, your own uh, master. You can produce anything you like. Uh, which is what he did. Now, what have I got here? Posters were vital in those times. Um, yes, I think I've said all that. Uh, yes, the poster had to draw attention to the passerby and not be so crammed with information that it defeated its purpose. Toulouse Trek was a communications genius in this particular form of communication. His posters caught the eye and were straight to the point. Now, um, this he conveyed the essence of the featured character in a deceptively simple way. He distinguished himself from other poster creators in this way. Um, he believed utterly in his work and had no problem being bold with it. Moulin Rouge reserved a seat for him and his paintings were displayed there and in other French nightclubs he visited London and could speak English relatively well. Now as time went on unfortunately Toulouse became an alcoholic. Some of this may have been caused by the world that he lived in and those with whom he associated I should imagine because the thing is if you're in a world full of nightclubs and girls and and drinks flowing freely <laughs> it's very easy to to have a drink and then have another one and have another one especially you know I mean you don't want to appear uh, not to be joining in so I think there would have been a certain amount of that I mean I think a lot of people can identify with having a certain amount of pressure uh, when they're in a drinking environment um, um, which is pretty much what I wrote down there. He frequented brothels to engage in sexual activity, but also exist among the uh, the women that work there. He often lived in brothels for weeks at a time, painting, uh, much to his mother's consternation, and uh, painting women for being and accepting them in a way that they were. Uh, he was a fine cook and had a collection of great recipes which were saved by a friend and published after his death. There is an English translation, The Art of Cuisine, published in 1966 as a tribute to him. He also invented some drink that was very strong, you know, blew the top of your head off. <laughs> and uh, he was quite famous for that as well. It was a blend of different drinks. He died in 1901 due to complications from his alcoholism and venereal disease. He is buried a few kilometres from his mother's family estate. A translation of his last words were, I knew, Papa, that you wouldn't miss the death. His mother continued to promote his work after his death. So, I mean, well, that says a fair bit about his father, but it was probably... Uh, his father was probably tremendously disappointed that his son had that affliction. 
because, you know, it was vital for members of the aristocracy to be able to pass on their estates and land and their title to their sons because, you know, the sons were the ones that were needed to inherit. And when the youngest son died, his father must have got very bitter about it, you know. Uh, anyway, we shall move on. Now, I've got all these photographs here of Toulouse as a young man, but I'm just going to show you just a little bit of the life of the like the age that Toulouse was at the times he was in. Now, what have I got here? The political times were turbulent in the second half of the 19th century. Napoleon III was the emperor of France at that time. He was a nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte. In 1870, when Henri was only six, France declared war on Prussia and Napoleon III was taken prisoner. The French Second Empire came to an end and the Prussians occupied France. And in 1871, the first communist government was form formed in France and it only lasted for 72 days. And as it happened, uh, the Prussians left France in 1875 after the French helped them to put the communist government down. Uh, the government formed was a nationalist and it was a secular one. And France became a republic with Marseille at the na as the national anthem. And in 1887, the Eiffel Tower was started. It marked the 100th anniversary of the French Revolution. When it was inaugurated in 1889, Gustave Eiffel climbed the 1,710 steps to the top of the tower to place the tricolored French flag at its summit. So that's just to give you a bit of an idea. I'll just see if I've, if I've got a picture of that here anywhere. I should do because it's, this book is called The Age of Progress, but whether or not that's what I was looking for. Uh, yes, that's when it was half done at any rate. Technology's master strokes. 984 foot iron tower uh, and of course this just goes on to to show all the building that was taking place and everything else I mean it was all it was an age of great change and you know a new invention invention happening every it seemed probably like every month or so something new was coming along um, We've got the electricity starting, and we've got the telephone, Thomas Edison's light globe there. Trains were going everywhere. Anyway, so that, that's the kind of progress was considered to be a, an excellent thing to be doing, put it that way. Now I'll just show you some of these posters that I was talking about. Um, there's, there's one there, it's packed full of detail, and this one down here, which, you know, that's not quite as, that's sort of quite good. You'll hear about this lady shortly. Uh, that was just a different person that advertised the, was advertising the Folly Berger there. Um, who was that? Cheret, C-H-E-R-E-T, and Eugene Grasset, Grasset, or Grasset, I don't, I'm sorry, I apologise for my ignorance in, in being able to pronounce those names. And this one, oh, this is a, another Grasset one, and that looks very Art Nouveau-ish, doesn't it? She looks like quite uh, wistful there. So I suppose you could say they were his rivals for business. And here's another page. Um, one Art Nouveau medium which was not limited to the eyes and pocketbooks of the rich was the poster. This was especially true in Paris, where posters were used to advertise everything from art shows to cars. Posters often popularised talent, but unknown sorry, talented but unknown artists who could eat for three months on the proceeds from one good design. 
Among these unknowns was Alphonse Mucha, who began his career with commissions from Sarah Bernhardt, and posters became such a rage that a black market for them developed, and some art dealers even advertised their talents to sell a Rembrandt, to buy a Mucha, or a Toulouse-Lautrec. And there's all the different posters that were around. All right, well, this is the age of progress that's from. Uh, the Great Ages of Man. I think it's a time life book. S.C. Birchall. So, right, now, on with Toulouse. Oh, yes. Yeah, I've got some Japanese uh, prints here too to show you, but that'll come in as I go on about Toulouse. Now, here's a picture of him as a child. And uh, you can see from the clothes he's wearing that uh, they're quite affluent there. And the pillar behind him is probably a pillar of the family home, I should imagine. And here he is as a young man. Are oh, those eyes? It just looks sad, doesn't he? And this is the family portrait, the extended family. And here's Toulouse sitting here with his hat in his lap. And I thought it was interesting the way he is popped just there, almost like he's, you know, an afterthought in a way. Uh, and there's, you know, with all the women and everything. But the men are all bunched together at the back here. And I suppose the young boys there. Uh, I think that photograph says an awful lot about family dynamics there. I mean, there's every chance that he wasn't necessarily placed there. There's every chance that Toulouse decided to put himself there in that position. Uh, it, you know, for all we know, he probably didn't even want to be in the photograph. So he, he probably grudgingly said, oh, all right, and just sat down there with the ladies. Um, so good for him if that was the case. Now here's a picture of him later in life. Um, now here's a little quote about what a friend said about him. He's a tiny little blacksmith who wears pins nez. That's these here with a little cord on the side. A shapeless little carpet bag of a man. He has thick lips and his hands are like the ones he draws with splayed bony fingers and curved thumbs. At first his smallness pains you, but then you notice he is very lively and extremely nice. He grunts between sentences and this masks his, sorry, this makes his lips part the way wind lifts the padding around the edge of a door. Um, this particular person who supplied this quote said, the myth is that he was a conflicted and tortured person and a tormented, sad and introspective creature. So this particular person felt that he wasn't, that wasn't the case. But I would imagine at times it was the case. <laughs> it's just that uh, he found a way to enjoy his life even though he was tortured in his own way. Um, here's a picture that he did when he was, one of his first paintings, a drawing, uh, this was of a horse on his family's estate, which is just lovely, isn't it? Look at how he's, he's got the blue in there to bring the, the horse's face forward into the picture. Yeah. So that's that one. Now here's a picture that gives you an idea of his stature. Now you can see that he has the normal torso and area here 
So really, if his legs hadn't have been broken and he hadn't have had this uh, abnormality of the bones, he would have been quite a tall man. And probably because that body is quite, quite a, a lengthy one. And as you can see, he walked with the assistance of a cane. Now he he probably liked to be on a horse because on a horse he he could be, you know, uh, well he probably liked the freedom of being on a horse. Put it that way. Now here he is uh, in his studio with all his paints there. Um, so that's another little. This one is where he is actually painting a picture that is used they use this for a poster later so there he is working on there and here is the the poster here lagulu or the glutton <laughs> she was called uh, i'm going to cover this later on so i i won't talk about this one now but there's one of his posters um i'll get back to that now, he did have a sense of fun. I don't know if it was fun so much as escapism. And so he used to like dressing up. He liked to, he dressed as a clown sometimes, which is highly symbolic as well, because they're considered to be tragic, aren't they, clowns? But anyway, here's one where he dressed up in a Japanese costume. And I'm not quite sure of why he's got this China doll here. Uh, but... You know, I'm sure he had a reason. So there he is. Now, he did train in the classical style to begin with. And here is one of his early ones when he was training to become a painter. The marble polisher, this is called. And here is the girl with the red hair that I mentioned. This is the laundress. A great, again, great use of colour. You know, she, he doesn't use a lot of colours there, but he certainly knows how to make, you know, give depth and dimension to a piece. Look at those fingers there. And here she is again. Uh, this is probably in the garden of that, that uh, man that I mentioned before. He had a garden and Toulouse did a whole series of pictures in the garden. Now Toulouse was influenced by Degas and I think you can certainly see some of that influence there in that one. This is called the toilet, or the toilet, the redhead washing in 1896. Now this is La Goulou arriving at the Moulin Rouge with two women. And uh, this is the one that I showed you the poster before of her. Well, I shall get to her, as I said. Now, it, it is said that she uh, enjoyed the company of ladies. Um, and I think that they do say, in France, uh, lesbianism was uh, permissible, apparently, very early in the piece. Um, but I would have thought that quite a few ladies in the brothels and places, not, not that she was a prostitute, she was a performer, but I should imagine that there would have been quite a few of them that because they serviced the men for their jobs, uh, when it came to actually having a relationship with someone uh, and someone that could satisfy them rather than them satisfying men, they may well have gravitated towards another woman uh, because naturally enough the other woman knew 
uh, what buttons to press or if I may put it that way. Now I've just got a few more pictures here before we get on to the posters which is really what I'm concentrating more on. It's just to give you an idea of his actual style. Uh, the dancer in her dressing room. And again, you can see the influence of Degas there. I mean, even the, the figure here. Um, then he did a portrait of Van Gogh. I think uh, he's also called Van Gogh, but I... I've always called him Van Gogh, so. Let's see if there's anybody else here. Oh, yes. Yeah. This is towards the end of his life. He had to go to an asylum because he, he had syphilis. Um, and syphilis, when you first get it, uh, you get a sore somewhere. It's either, you know, in the nether regions or it could be on your lips somewhere. And when that sore disappears, uh, you know, they used to think that that was the end of it. But of course it wasn't. The disease just uh, quietly worked its havoc on the, on the body um, uh, until eventually it came back with a force. And you got delusions and, um, and then you got paralysis in your legs. It was called, I think another name for it was the general paralysis of the insane or something because it did play it made your mind a bit crazy at times so Toulouse went to a sanatorium his mother made him go there um, and when he was there of course naturally enough he wanted to get out so he did a lot of paintings and pictures to try and show that he was sane and a lot of them he did from memory and this was one of the circus paintings that he did and he did convince the authorities in the end, and uh, he was released. Now, uh, here we are. There's, what got that out there for? I'll just put it over there for the moment. Now, here's a picture here of the inside of a brothel. Uh, and red seems to have been the order of the day. And women basically off duty, as you might say preparing for an evening so that's one of his paintings there and this one is Jane Avril she was a performer um, and she uh, she was very slender and she also had these jiggly sort of movements twitchy movements because she had what they called in the day St Vitus dance or a form of it uh, and you're born with that and it usually manifests in your 40s you know they, they didn't realize they had it until they were fairly late in the piece but I think she must have got a few twitches and things before she got to that age um, and I think Toulouse to a degree identified with her because they both had these weird symptoms at times and so they had something in common and they stayed friends uh, you know for quite some or I say friends um, I think at times they fell out because she wasn't that happy with the way he depicted her in some of the paintings and things so now let's move on now we're nearly there this is just another painting of the poster that I'm going to show you this guy here was her dancing partner and apparently he was uh, a very good dancer. He, you know, they used to call him Mr. Rubber or something because he could move his limbs around in very strange ways. Um, then here's a rather, this is the end of the, the uh, actual paintings and pictures and drawings that I'm going to show you. This is a, a prostitute, uh, basically at the end of her shift looking absolutely worn out i mean she almost looks flat into the bed doesn't she she looks like she's deflated right down um, and it just says um, in four colors black blue orange and white lautrec has quickly and spontaneously painted 
a prostitute lying collapsed on the bed. Her client has just left the room, stretched out on her back with her right hand resting on her thigh and her left arm bent at a 90 degree angle to her side. She is completely fatigued. Her black stockings are pulled up over her thin legs, which hang down as two limp forms from the bed to the floor. This lifeless position conveys utter exhaustion. Mm. Right, now here's a poster that Toulouse did fairly early on in his career for confetti. The J&E Bella Company asked him to do a poster for them to advertise their confetti. Confetti was banned after the 1892 Mardi Gras. This was for reasons of public health as piles of confetti were picked up off the dirty streets and used to confetti fight. Also it was seen as contributing to the moral decline as confetti thrown at a young lady was considered an amorous advance and the Mardi Gras was already frowned upon by respectable circuses, circles as a focus of moral depravity. So, and there's all the gloves throwing the confetti. I suppose she's the desirable young woman. Then there, this isn't a Toulouse-Lautrec poster, but it's just to give you an idea Here's it's rather a grand poster, nonetheless. Uh, Montmartre. Montmartre was a separate village from the metropolis and was a destination for the outsiders of French culture and thinkers and radicals. It was described as a bizarre land in which swarmed writers, painters, musicians, sculptors and architects. They mostly lived in lodgings and were surrounded by the workers of Montmartre. Mamash was the home of every kind of artist, said a writer. These people made up the audience of the, Ch the Chat Noir, uh, a cabaret that provided raucous and at times outrageous entertainment that they flocked in for. It is to the north of the centre of Paris, and because it was a fair way out of Paris, it was a cheap place to live. So the working class and the poor mixed with the artists and three thinkers in the second half of the 19th century. Degas, Van Gogh and Renoir all spent time there and it's pronounced Chenoir or Chenoir apparently. Uh, so and this is where a particular man used to appear uh, an entertainer and I shall show you his famous poster not too far away. So here is the famous Moulin Rouge, which just about everybody's heard of. And there's the windmill there. Now, this went out into vast gardens and, and it had vast dance halls and everything in behind that frontispiece there. Um, it's, uh, it was provocative, colourful, decadent and theatrical in Paris in the late 1800s. When the Moulin Rouge opened, Toulouse Dautrec was commissioned to create a series of posters for the cabaret, producing the exquisitely iconic images in this collection, perfect for lovers of vintage styling. So that, that was uh, advertising the website, I think, that showed the posters. They still sell the posters today. Uh, so yeah, there's the famous building. And in the backyard, apparently, or backyard, <laughs> in the back <laughs> gardens, there was a huge elephant and it was big enough for an orchestra to sit in between its legs, you know. And people used to come out from inside it and all sorts of things went on. Um, with nearly 600,000 visitors every year, Moulin Rouge is the top 10 most must-see items on the tourist list. Located at the bottom of a hill in the Montmartre neighbourhood, then a semi-rural setting favoured by artists, Moulin Rouge opened its doors in 1889 to offer champagne-filled parties during which remarkable dancers and singers performed. Very soon the establishment became world famous for a scandalous dance called the Can-Can. There's a colour one of them. Must have been coloured in. Right. 
And here's a glimpse of the inside. With enough champagne bottles emptied, spectators found themselves willing participants on the dance floor that was installed to admire the performers up close. Um, there was nighttime delirium in some of Toulouse's famous works. It is mainly thanks to Toulouse Lautrec's posters that the two most colourful Moulin Rouge dancers remain in our consciousness. And there's the inside there. And apparently that is what happened. I mean, the, the uh, performer or the dancer used to come out on the dance floor and dance around people and um, flirt with them and you know flip their hats off and make coarse remarks and you know and they all used to cajole back you know it must have been like a back and forth kind of thing going on now here's a picture here of Jules Charette C-H-E-R-E-T and Lautrec with a poster and there they are just looking at it I'm not sure whose poster that is because I can't see to lose it looks a bit cool for him uh, but uh, I can't see his iconic little TL on there so maybe it wasn't his but it's just to give you an idea then we have there's his little circle there that's the Toulouse the track when he used to um, make the posters because he used to use a lithograph technique uh, and the lithographs uh, it was like a stone um, they used to carve into the stone to make the picture and then it used to get rolled the paper used to go between the stone and the roller and it used to roll through with a certain color on it they used to go through and then they'd oil up the stone so that the next bit of color wouldn't uh, the oil wouldn't um, allow that color through and then there'd be another layer of color put through um, it's quite a process I mean you can look up how they did it uh, but it, it's a bit like screen printing you know where you have to block out you do one roll through and then you have to block out what you want another color to pick up and all that sort of stuff uh, La Troupe de Mille Eglantine 1895 poster so that's just advertising the girls in the can-can now <clears throat> excuse me here is Jane um, sorry, I'm just, I'm just making sure it's her Jane Avril <clears throat> excuse me the public ball was Jane's second awakening um, her talent led to prestigious theatrical engagements with an exceptional dance number. Um, I think that was the Can Can. But anyway, there's there's a picture of of Jane Avril. Just making sure it's her. Uh, but here's another picture. Now this this isn't Toulouse's drawing of her, but I just love this because. I think it gives you a real sense of her ability to entice you into wanting to watch her, wanting to see what she's doing. Uh, those legs are fabulous, aren't they? And she's just got that look about her, as though she could captivate you. Uh, they say she wasn't a great beauty or anything, but she could uh, change her facial features uh, in almost like a rubber way. Um, she was a French can-can dancer made famous by Toulouse Lautrec through his paintings. She was extremely thin and had jerky movements and sudden contortions. She was nicknamed La Melon Melonite after an explosive. She was said to have an underlying medical disorder that caused the jerks and sudden movements. Her dancing seems to have helped her to cope with this. She was hired by the Moulin Rouge nightclub in 1889. There was a major event planned on the Champs de Lycée at the Jardin de Paris, a major cafe concert venue. To advertise the event, Toulouse-Lautrec produced a poster of her that spread her name far and wide. 
She travelled to London to show off the can-can. She remained a star for many years. Uh, she ended up, she married a philanderer, ended up in poverty. Um, and she's the character that Nicole Kidman played in Baz Luhrmann's version of Moulin Rouge, uh, which uh, someone said reduced Toulouse to the level of, you know, a sidekick of some sort, which I find astonishing if that was the case. I haven't seen the film, so I can't really say. Uh, anyway, so here is the, the poster, or one of them anyway. And this is where the idea of the Japanese style of laying down colour and form comes in. So I'll just show you the Japanese style here. There's, there's one. You can see the colour is laid down quite flat, but the figures are outlined. And also, I just have one picture here, again, where they, the colour is fairly flat. But this was all new to the artists of the time in, the, in France. They'd never seen anything like it. Um, So for posters, uh, it certainly lends itself to posters and they were wood blocks as well. So they would have learnt a bit more about how to print from that. And apparently Japanese influence was all the rage uh, at the time, which probably explains Toulouse's little costume as well. Now here's another one here. Um, I won't show that one because I don't know if that was his. This is just a close-up of the poster that I showed you before. And this one shows her, she used to put her arms behind her leg when she was, and they, it, you know, hold it that way and sort of wiggle it around. <laughs> and it's almost like it's in a magnifying glass there. Now this person here, this is Louis Fuller. And she was an American actress and dancer who was a pioneer of modern dance and theatrical lighting techniques. And there'll be a link below to a dance that she does, but it wasn't her in the, in the little clip that is available for you to see. It's mistaken to be her, but it isn't. Um, but it, it probably accurately portrays what she did anyway. She started out in burlesque as a skirt dancer in vaudeville and circus shows and she experimented with a long skirt and it was moved and could reflect the light. She used silk costumes and illuminated them in different lights and she created the serpentine dance. Um, uh, she decided to go to Europe because she felt she wasn't being appreciated in America and she was a regular performer at the Folie Berger. Her skirts became more and more voluminous and her body became hidden underneath the fabric. She used coloured gels and chemicals for the luminescent lighting in her act. She became a symbol of the Art Nouveau movement. It looks as though she is holding sticks to extend her arms when she... You'll see what I mean when you look at the little clip below, you'll see um, what I'm talking about. She became... Uh, there are modern performances of her work. Jodie Sperling performs and it looks like a flower bloom dancing. So basically this Jodie Sperling, I had a look at it the other day and she's got even longer sticks. And what happens is 
she had this big long kind of voluminous silky looking gown that went over the top of her of her arms and then she'd wave her arms like this and stand on tippy toe and everything and swirl them around and make all these shapes and the colors used to change and she was used to stand on kind of a big circle that used to light up i don't know how they did it but uh, anyway in those days you wonder and uh, it just mesmerized audiences um, and you'll see as i say if you have a look now this one here uh, this is by Jules Charette. Uh, this isn't one of Toulouse's posters, but they're, they're, that just shows the gown. Uh, but it really doesn't give you a very good idea of what she actually did. You'd have to actually see it. Now here's a picture here where you can, it's not a very good one, but you can see the length of the fabric there. That gives you a bit of an idea. But then she swoops it down and it's like watching a flower bloom dance. It's quite amazing. Um, and I think Toulouse's picture. Um, this is their little drawing. I think he was trying to show the movement in the, in the outfit with, you know, I'm not sure that works too well. Maybe it works better when you can see it properly. I mean, that's not a very good picture. Um, and the silent movie sequence, a depiction, a depiction of Fuller's serpentine dance, however, not actually Fuller performing. And that's what you'll see if you go to the link. Uh, and it gives you a much better idea because I can't really describe it adequately. Now here, this is... Uh, Louise Weber. What did I call her? She was Louise somebody else, wasn't it? Fuller. So I'm getting the Fullers and the Webbers mixed up. Uh, this is Louise Weber, not Fuller. And she was known as the Queen of Montmartre because she was very irreverent and outspoken and vulgar, is how she's described. She was a French cancan -can dancer and the star of the Moulin Rouge. Weber became known as Le Goulou because as a teenager, she was known for downing cabaret patrons drinks while she was dancing. She was liked for her charming personality and for her dancing skills. She had a heart embroidered on her knickers and she would use that to tease the males in the audience. She could do a high kick that would flip off a man's top hat. She was booked as a permanent headline act and her name became synonymous with the Moulin Rouge and the Can Can. In her day, she was the highest paid entertainer in Paris and she became the toast of Paris. She later struck out on her own and, her to and toured France, but she wasn't successful in doing that. So there she is. And there's another picture of her here. striking a quite an in, a quite an inelegant pose and she's got a little crown on her head there uh, yes so that's that's her there but of course she was in character so and here's a picture of her the poster and of course she's almost twerking there really to use a modern term <laughs> And all the men would really try to see what the heart, what, where the heart was on her knickers, because it was embroidered on. Now this here, people have wondered what that was, and I have heard from a lecture that that was one of the lights. See, there's lights there, and that was just one of the lights that's there. Um, now it says here, and ex this is an example of her brash behaviour. Um, the t uh, Lagulu, described as low-born and vulgar, was the prototype of the working-class girl found in the dancing halls. Louise Weber, her real name, was born in 1868 and passed to posterity as Lagulu for her greedy behaviour. She liked to empty the guest's glasses that stood within her reach. Um, she was not impressed with royalty. Hey, Wales! Lagulu addressed the heir to the British throne. The champagne is in your name, so is it you who pays, or is it your mama, Queen Victoria, inviting us? 
So this is the sort of stuff that happened. And you can just imagine everybody hooting and yelling and screaming and carrying on. And in a way, you know, Queen Victoria had a little tiny little crown on her head. And it's almost like she's poking fun of Queen Victoria there. Because Queen Victoria was known for her straight-laced ways, uh, at least in public. I'm not sure about privately. But in public, she was, you know, it was all very formal and there was none of this uh, frivolity going on, that's for sure. Now... Uh, Toulouse remained Lagulu's friend well after her triumphs. In this picture they sit side by side with La Mon Farage, the cheese kid. That was another performer opposite. There's that picture there. And there's Toulouse and Lagulu and the other person there that answered. And it just says, Soon Lagulu ceased to please and turned to her painter friend for help. Now self-employed, she would sell her renown to the fairgrounds to recall her prestigious past. And the track painted two large panels exposed on the front of, uh, in the, of her fairground hut. And that's those panels there, there and there. And it says, um, a few years later, when in debt, she had to sell these panels and they were cut into smaller canvases by a greedy merchant. In 1929, they were bought and restored by the Louvre and can be seen there. So there you are. Well, it's good that they were recovered anyway. And now we go on to the reason why I'm wearing this and this. This fellow here. This is probably the most famous of all the posters that Toulouse de Trek ever put out. Um, now this guy, he was actually a bourgeois by birth, but he adopted guttural sort of language, the language of the ordinary person, the vernacular, and he used to uh, be quite sarcastic and carry on uh, he used to entertain the audiences at that La Chat Noir you know with the, the cat on the poster he used to be there he used to entertain he was an MC uh, eventually he was an MC of his own club he opened his own place up and he was one of Toulouse's first friends that wasn't actually an artist or anything else they were firm friends um, and uh, I'm just trying to think, you know, if you could imagine, you know how the Oscars were, where you'd get uh, an MC that was particularly ridiculing people in the audience and telling jokes about them and to their, at their expense and all this sort of thing. Well, that's what this character was like when he performed and he sang and, you know, he did a whole lot of different things, quite a character. And his outfit... That's the outfit from the back. That's what he used to wear when he was on stage. And for all we know, he probably wore it elsewhere as well. Aristide Bruant was a French cabaret singer, comedian, nightclub owner. He is famous for being the man in the red scarf and the black cape in the famous posters by Toulouse-Lautrec. He was bourgeois by birth, but he adopted earthy language to explore the struggles of the poor in his performances. He began his performing career at cafes and concerts. His performance outfit was red shirt, black velvet jacket, high boots and a long red scarf. He became a star of Montmartre and he became a friend of Toulouse Lautrec's. In 1885, Bruant opened his own club and became the master of ceremonies so he could run things his own way. Uh, often using the comedy of the insult to poke fun at the distinguished guests in the audience. He was inspired by vaudeville and his act was a mix of song, satire, sarcasm and entertainment. Now then, that still doesn't explain this particular part, does it? Until you come to the fourth doctor in Doctor Who. And he is supposed to have been, or was, because the, the writer actually said that this character 
inspired this person's outfit and as you, he's one of the more popular doctors as well now my stripes aren't horizontal like Tom Baker's are but nonetheless I thought I would wear it in Tom Baker's honour so there's one picture and here's the other picture of him and I think I think it's <laughs> you can certainly see the influence there can't you and he was quite irreverent as a Doctor Who actually now I think about it he used to do that he used to poke fun and, and generally be a bit of a clown uh, and he was a very popular doctor. Actually, uh, Tom Baker played Rasputin and he didn't do a bad job. Uh, who else was in? Oh, I won't go into that. Anyway, <laughs> it's easy to go off on a tangent. Now, here's the little mark of Toulouse-Lautrec, his signature. And when he did his posters uh, and they were, you know, en masse, produced en masse, then the stamp used to go on to show that it was an original, it was his work. And when he died, he, there were some that he hadn't signed and his mother had the symbol made so that she could uh, authenticate them. Uh, and that can be a bit of a trap because I know Andy Warhol, who uh, they say was influenced by, by Toulouse de Trek, he did a lot of prints um, and there were people that sent them to authenticators. They might have bought them at an auction or something like that, some of Andy Warhol's posters, and sent them off to be authenticated. And if they didn't authenticate them, they put the big mark on them so that they were basically valueless. And they might have bought them for $50,000 or whatever. Uh, so you'd have to be very careful before you sent anything off for authentication, because if it doesn't pass the muster, that's it. And I mean, how are they to know, really? Because when these, you know, Andy Warhol himself, I mean, there used to be factories, uh, you know, not factories, but say groups of 15 or so, uh, screen printing and doing things, uh, doing versions of his posters and everything. And he might turn up once a week or something and uh, say, oh, yes, that's fine. That's what I want and wander out again. So, I mean, you know, they were all his, uh, but who knows? Anyway, strange world, the art world. And here's another closer up that Harlequin's done there to show the Toulouse, the Trek, a TL. Um, yeah. And it looks a little bit Japanesey as well, doesn't it? I think he was very much influenced by the Japanese. Now, this one here is one that I've included. This is right near the end now. Uh, of This is called... Uh, the rat, rat mort, the dead rat. Um, and I think it just shows you, it's, it's got the intimate setting of a private dining room at the restaurant. The rat mort, dead rat, Lautrec depicts the aging coquette Lucy Jordan, smothered in thick makeup with lips painted ruby red. Jordan appears like some overripe fruit. Lautrec's use of a rich palette and loose brushwork suggests the decadent nature of the subject. Jordan was a high-class prostitute and is accompanied by her lover. The Baron D. W. Lautrec's presence in the scene is suggested by the placement of a glass on the table opposite Jordan. So, I don't know if he was there or not. I mean, that's a bit funny. But anyway, I think it just shows that towards the end of his uh, life, anyway, he really got into the strong, bright colours, didn't he? A bit like Dagar did. So, now then, I think I have a little conclusion here somewhere. Conclusion. Toulouse must have been acutely aware of his father's disappointment in his physical problems. His father would probably have felt a sense of failure that would have been mortifying for Toulouse. Um, he lived in a time where people paid to see human beings who were born with deformities uh, in side alley shows and who were referred to quite openly as freaks. You know, they had the elephant man and the skeleton man and the woman with four legs and all this sort of stuff. 
And these people were paid, you know, good money to be these objects of interest to the uh, people in the audience. They had traveling shows where it was just accepted entertainment. Um, you know, so I think that was the unfortunate thing for him, living in those times where people did tend to publicly ridicule you. Um, but nonetheless, he he may have been ridiculed at times. But then I think when he lived in the brothels and when he was doing his home entertaining and he was making his drinks and he was cooking and he was in company that accepted him, you know, with his humour and his wit and his warmth as a person in intimate company, people that he trusted, that he knew, knew him as a person, who loved him as a person, who liked him never mind about what he looked like or how tall he was or anything else. They accepted him and they loved him as such. And I think in those circumstances, that's when he was really glad to be alive. He was glad to be part of it all. Um, so I don't think you can look at his life as being one long uh, time of, you know, uh, self-loathing and drinking to escape from it all. I think a lot of his drinking started from the fact that he lived is like living over a pub <laughs> you know, I mean uh, you either abstain completely or you succumb and I think to a certain degree it was more that he was enjoying himself with his buddies and then there would have been times probably when he got syphilis that's probably when and the symptoms started to manifest themselves he may well then have drunk himself into oblivion because there would have been a lot of pain involved. I mean, he already had pain from his condition anyway. So, you know, and pain relief, it certainly wasn't uh, uh, as good as it is today, shall we say. Um, so, you know, it was either that or, or see if you could get opium probably, which he certainly probably wouldn't have wanted to do because he wanted to keep working. He was driven to keep working. So I think in that way, uh, we can look at his life and think, well, you know, even his posters suggest a certain amount of happiness and gaiety about what he was doing. You know, that kind of um, abandoned, abandoned uh, feeling of uh, living in a world, uh, um, a kind of a parallel universe, if you like. Uh, you know, when he lived in the brothels and in these uh, places of amusement and entertainment, there was a whole dark, horrible world out there somewhere. Uh, but that wasn't the world he was living in, mostly. I mean, yes, there would have been times, you know, with the girls, the prostitutes that he lived with, they would have had hard times and, you know, when they would have been ill and all the rest of it. And they, you know, they usually used to help each other to get better. Um, so I think to a degree, you know, maybe when he got sick, they used to mother him, most likely, you know, um, and it wasn't as though he missed out on the physical side, obviously he didn't. So, um, you know, as, as things go, his life might have been a short one, but I think it was, uh, he was there for, um, shall we say, a good time, not a long time. Uh, that was probably what his maxim would have been. Is to have a good time rather than a, a long time on this earth. Um, oh, sorry about the voice. <laughs> I think that's probably all he would like to say. Um, and uh, yeah, that comes to the end now. So uh, thank you for your company. Uh, um, it's been interesting. <laughs> and uh, I shall see you again for another artist in the future, depending on which one pops into my head. <laughs> and uh, we shall take it from there. So we've gone from the Impressionism now and we're going into the Post-Impressionism world, even though I did do Cezanne some time ago, actually, and he's a Post-Impressionist, so sometimes they come in in different orders. <laughs> okay, so I'll say goodbye for now. Goodbye from Mary Rose. <laughs>